we've been in a series all about identity, who we are in Christ. I'm, I'm loving it, just like McDonald's. I'm loving it. And this would be technically episode seven, but, okay, here's what the Lord prompted me to do, and, I, and I'm confident that the Lord prompted me to do this. I'm closing the chat. As much as I love you guys, I've got to pay attention to what the Lord has called me to do. We are going to do a sub-series, a mini-series that is still tied to identity, but it's mainly revolving around the specific idea of what it means to be beloved. Because uh, what I was going to do is this was just going to be, you know, episode number seven, all about being children of God. And I was going to tackle the concept of being beloved, being loved by God. But that is such a profound, divine concept um, that God has given us the grace to understand to a degree. But there is no way that I can exhaustively teach on the love of God. I'm, I'm not dare going to try and, 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 and claim to have that ability. I don't. But I, I did realize that in preparation for this that there was so much revolving around being loved and walking as those who are loved and enjoying the love of God. There's so much that goes into this that I could not just pack this into one small sermon. What I want to do instead is we're still addressing identity, what it means that we are, you know, who we are in Christ, but we're going to take four weeks, this week, next week, the next week, and the next week. There's going to be four episodes all about what it means to be loved by God. You know, I got a lot of your guys' feedback in one of my community posts where I said, look, I would love to know what you guys would, would, would want me to touch on when it comes to the love of God, when it comes to being loved by God. You know, people got into, well, you should break down the Greek and there's seven different words and to technically be different kinds of love and, you know, go all the way back to the Hebrew and people were talking about here are characteristics of God's love. Uh, you guys had a tremendous amount of helpful feedback. Um, and so I, I, I brought all that in. And I thought, you know what? There's too much. I need to break this down. So today, this week, what we're going to address is what it means that we are beloved. This is a core um, characteristic of who you are in Jesus. Now, it's one thing to say you are loved, like you, you are the object of someone's love. It's an entirely different thing to say that you are beloved, and I'll explain why. We're going to tackle that today. We're going to look at how Jesus is beloved, how we are beloved in him, how we're chosen to be beloved, uh, how there's actually a a calling on those who there's a there's a specific kind of expectation set of expectations for those who are now beloved of God. You, You know, when I read and survey the New Testament, specifically New Covenant believers, whenever they're referred to as beloved, there's always this urging attached to it. I noticed that. So I want to touch on that. In week two, what we're going to look at is what it means to live as those who are beloved. So today I'm setting the foundation somewhat for what it means that we're beloved in Christ. Next week we'll tackle what it looks like to live as those who are loved or to be loved by God. Week three, we'll look at the love of God all throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Survey what that looks like, the different dimensions of God's love, how that's fleshed out. Um, the the different implications on our life. And then the final week, what I'm going to do, because I came across this in my study, is that there is a difference between the way God loves his children and the way he loves the world. So we're going to tackle why God loves his children differently than the world, how, what that means for us, and how to properly explain that to people who go, you know, you say God loves the world, then why is he condemned, you know, why is there condemnation, you know, they, they seem to have an imbalance in their theology when it comes to the justice and the love of God. And so we'll address that in week four. Um, but today, all that laid out. So I've, I've given you the roadmap so you know what to come, what to expect when you come each week. Um, full disclosure, I am running on probably five hours of sleep. And that doesn't sound like, you know, a a big deal, but going to bed at two for me is, and getting no sleep last night, there was a lot of just, I'm going to call it spiritual warfare because I I, I have a strong sense that's what it was. Um, And so I'm, I'm fighting to be here. So if I fumble over my words or I don't get, you know, thoughts out clearly, forgive me. I'm not functioning as well as I usually do. And God will grace me nonetheless. I believe that he'll come through and meet me in the gap. Fill that in. Okay. So what we're going to do is, is you need to understand. I really hope you understand this. Lord, give them understanding that we as believers are beloved of God. And as I broke this down, you know, in the, in, in the English, I separated the word be loved. I was thinking about how like we as believers don't know how to be loved by God. That is a, that is a very difficult thing for so many of us. 
And when you don't know how to be loved, you don't know how to enjoy life. You don't know how to enjoy all that God has made available to you. You don't know how to access all that Christ has purchased and, and given to you. It actually flows within this thing called the love of God. And, uh, you know, a lot of us have been hurt by so many people in our past. And we've had church hurt. We've had, you know, family hurt us. We've had friends abandon us. We've had people who we thought would never, ever speak ill about us, you know, gossip about us and make fun of us and, and you know, um, stab us in the back when we least expected it. We've had a lot of, in other words, we have a lot of negative experience revolving around this thing called being loved by people. Um, we've seen people, you know, abuse our, our trust and, um, you know, abuse our relationship. And so, so it's really hard for us to approach a, a perfect, um, eternally existent, divine, all-knowing God who loves us perfectly. Because there's so much baggage from our life that we bring into the equation in our relationship with God where we just assume His love is just like what we've seen and experienced in the world. And that's not true at all. There are some helpful, accurate images of God's love that we can see in the world around us. But in no way, shape, or form does the world in any way or, sh or capacity perfectly reflect, reflect the love of God to us. So I can't say that God loves me the exact way fill in the blank love me or the way the culture defines love. I mean, this is the most appropriate message, I think, uh, during a month where it's all about being inclusive and being tolerant and being approve of, approve of my lifestyle. It's all this, this, this deep longing for, if you're going to sum up Pride Month, it's, it's rooted in this deep longing to be loved. And it's being, it, you know, expressed poorly for sure there's, there's all these you know ways that it's like oh, maybe we shouldn't uh you know exercise this deep longing for love in this way maybe i shouldn't project this onto people at the at the core of what people want this month is to be loved whether they call it tolerance acceptance inclusiveness um whatever it may be there's a deep longing in the human heart to be loved and god supplies us that perfectly, fully, in a way that you and I can't fathom. But what does it mean to be loved by God? That's the question. You know, the word beloved, what I've come across, actually primarily is a title for, for the Messiah. Um, he is the beloved of God. So from this main idea that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King, the divine, uh, only begotten Son of God, He is the beloved from that main idea flows everything else that you and I get to experience. So what you're going to see is what it means for us to be beloved or walk as beloved or to be loved by God. It all connects to this foundational idea that Jesus is the beloved of God. Now, when you actually look at what it means to be beloved, um, beloved means one who is deeply divinely loved specifically by God. Now you can have earthly fathers like Abraham who has a beloved son being Isaac. But for someone to be beloved of God means there is a deep divine love flowing into their life in this way, okay? It means God esteems them, God favors them, God chooses them. They're a dear one to God. Uh, one who is beloved has a personal intimate experience of God's love for them. One who is beloved is essentially in the love of God. They're in that, that, that waterfall flowing onto them called the love of God. And this is important because um, you and I are constantly in this thing. Thank you, Christian, for the gift. I'm going to message you after this. Save your money for people who need it. But thank you for the gift. Um, I lost my train of thought because Christian is just awesome. Um, when it comes to being loved, there, there are all these different dimensions that I discovered in my study, um, especially this idea of being chosen. But I want to start with Jesus. Now, remember, beloved, again, it's this unique, personal, intimate experience of the love of God in the sense that God esteems, favors, chooses, prefers, and looks upon them as one of his dear ones. That, that's the best way. You can run to a Greek lexicon and go, well, beloved, actually, and I did. Um, but this is, I, I, I've, 
kind of, uh, what's it called? I told you I can't think today. I've kind of mapped out as clearly as I can see in Scripture what beloved means, um, you know, universally throughout ev- every usage and the way it's, you know, defined in the Greek for sure. That that's It's helpful. Um, but they have all these different dimensions to it, so it's hard to pinpoint and just say, well, to be, be beloved is, <clears throat> it goes so deep. And so you and I, believers, brothers and sisters, I, I know I've spent a lot of time already, wasted a lot of time, but I, I want you to know that you are beloved of God. You don't need to feel like you do. Your emotions don't need to line up with it. Your feelings don't need to match up with it. You don't need, you just need to come to a realization that because, and we'll see this in scripture, Jesus is the beloved. You might say the one ultimately loved by God. That, that's a helpful way of understanding beloved. Jesus is the one ultimately loved by God. Um, just, just this favor and choosing, all this flows to Jesus. Because of that, you and I get to be beloved as well. So, Jesus is beloved. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Behold, you know, as Jesus is getting baptized, the heavens open, the Spirit descends like a dove, and there's a voice from heaven that says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. And so you'll see when, when it comes to being beloved, uh, I, <laughs> we live in a culture and in, in, a, in a world where it's like, if you, be, if you think it, it's true. Or if you feel like it, it's true. If your emotions are expressed in this way, those are, those are factual. As if like my emotions and feelings are completely reliable. And that's just not true. We li- so then we project that onto our relationship with God and we say, well, I don't feel beloved. I, don't, I look at my circumstances. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see any evidence in my life physically that I am beloved of God. And the, ma- the fact of the matter is, if God says you are, if his word says you are, then you don't need any said set of circumstances to align with what God says because of the fact that what he says is automatically true. Regardless of whether or not what you're looking at in life seems to line up with that. If God says it is true, period. And we need to come to a place in our life where we go, I am loved by God. Even in those times where I don't feel like it, it doesn't seem like it, my emotions are telling me something else, he does say that he loves me. And here's this key characteristic of what it means to be for Jesus to be the beloved son. It's that the father is deeply pleased with him. Now, I don't want to jump ahead, but the reason I bring this up is because Jesus being the, the ultimate beloved of the Father means there's a deep pleasure that the Father has for the Son. Now, because we'll see that we're in Christ, I'm just giving you, uh, I guess, a little sneak peek. That is ultimately going to be true of us as well. That God is deeply pleased or delights in us. Is he always pleased with our life? Not always. Is he always pleased with my thoughts? Not always. Is he always pleased with my, with my conduct and my interactions with people? Not always. But is God always pleased with me? As someone who is made in his image and born again in his son through faith. As someone who has right standing with him through the righteousness of Christ. God does have a pleasure, a delight in those who are his beloved. So that's something important to understand. Um, I'll take you to Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. Um, similar situation, but on the Mount of Transfiguration, you got Peter, James, John, three knuckleheads brought by Jesus, probably to keep them out of trouble. They see Moses and Elijah. Peter puts his foot in his mouth. Shouldn't have said what he said. Essentially goes, I'm terrified. I need to come up with something quick. Hey, Jesus, I have. let's stay here forever. I'll build a house for you, for Moses. I'm a handyman. I'm a fisherman at heart, but I, I, I can get around. Okay, I, I can build something for you. And then what we see is a cloud overshadowing them. And a voice from the cloud, this is God shutting down Peter's idea. Kind of like when you nicely go, when my kids come up to me and go, I have an idea. And I go, mm, this is a terrible idea, but how do I not crush their spirits? That's kind of what's happening here. God's shutting this down <laughs> and letting Peter know, not, not what's going to happen. Instead, the voice says, this is my beloved son. Once again, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. 
So in this context right here, for Jesus to be the beloved means he's the appointed, perfect revelation of the Father, the ultimate authority, the voice that most perfectly represents the Father's heart. He's the ultimate spoken word from the Father. And once again, we see this aspect of the Father is pleased with Jesus. Now you and I, <clears throat> again, we have so much baggage and experience and negative you know, uh, childhood trauma where it's like, I, I wanted so badly for this person to be pleased with me. Or for, I wanted their pleasure. I wanted them to to have a, a kind of delight in me, and you know, and and so we we spend our lives going after what's called people pleasing. I'm just trying to please them so they're pleased with me, and we bring that into our Christian life, where it's like I God is only pleased with me as an image bearer, child of God, when my life fill in the blank. And I, I, I've already touched on this for several episodes, that there's a difference between our lifestyle and our identity. God is pleased with you at the core, who you are, which is disconnected from how you live, but it does affect how you live, right? Who I am affects how I live. So this is not like God is only pleased with you when you fill in the blank. This is if you're in Christ through faith, righteous. This, doesn't, this is not an excuse to get away with sin. Don't put words in my mouth. This is me trying to get you to understand that to be beloved is at the core. There is a deep pleasure that God has with you because of his son, not because of the way that you live or conduct yourself. Now, when my life does match up with God in his ways and his word, then God is pleased with my life. He's pleased with what I'm doing. And it's hard for us to disconnect the two, our identity from our life, because we essentially have been trained by culture to think how you live is who you are. And I've had several conversations lately with people who think they are the product of their lifestyle when they're believers. It's like, well, only when I'm living holy, that's when I truly am holy in the sight of God. Or only when I'm living righteous, that's when I'm truly righteous in the sight of God. And they, and they can't get around the idea that, no, no, the, the way that God... They just can't see the fact that the way God sees you now is based on his son. It is not based on your performance. Now, in this case, Jesus being the beloved, it does include this, this obedience and, and, and you know, not valuing his life even unto death and you know, following the Father's will even into the grave. It includes these things. But for us to be positioned in him through faith means he's done all the hard work, all the labor, so that we can enjoy being beloved as we, as we begin to live as those who are beloved of God, which is going to include holiness and righteousness. Matthew 12, 18 says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is pleased. Three times Jesus is referred to as beloved in Matthew, the beloved son the uniquely favored, preferred, esteemed, chosen son. And every time, it includes this, the father is pleased with him. Now, is God pleased with the life of his son and the obedience of his son? Absolutely. But at the core, this can be traced back to like eternity past. The father has always had, the son has always had, and vice versa. There's been this shared, perfect, eternal fully satisfying love expressed uh, within the Godhead. And so this is nothing new for the Father to be pleased. Just now, Jesus has taken on a new form in terms of taking on human nature, and now he's living as one of us to represent us. And so now there's, there's, there's this extra dimension of the Father's pleased with the way the Son is conducting himself as one of us. He's being what none of us ever could, and that, that pleases the Father. Um, but at the core, the father is deeply pleased with the son because it's relational. Meaning, um, trying to explain this the best way I possibly can. I'm, I know I'm getting ahead of myself. We see God loving us as a transactional thing. We're like, if I can build enough brownie points, then I can exchange that for God's love for me. If I can do enough things for God, if I can resist sin long enough, if I can break enough addiction in my life and live holy and pure enough, I can build enough, you know, uh, I don't know, points with God that I can exchange for love. 
And I go, now, God, I'd like, to, I'd like to exchange all of my good works and holiness for your love for me. And the thing is, you could never earn the love of God. That's what makes it grace. There's no transaction you can make to effectively earn or receive the love of God through something you do. The whole point of God loving, and we'll get to this in episode three, is that it is an abundant act of grace that he expresses any kind of love for us. It is undeserved. It's something I have not earned. It's something that is inherently, to me, not something I'm entitled to. I could never be. So what Jesus does as the ultimate beloved son who comes and pleases the father as one of us, not just in a transactional sense where it's like, he's living perfectly, he never sinned, he never failed, but also in a relational sense. The father has a relationship with the son that ultimately gets extended to us through faith. And so the same degree of pleasure and delight that we see the father having for the son is going to be extended to those who are in his son. And when you get that, you stop performing for God and you start enjoying his love, not by abusing his grace with sin, but you enjoy his love through gratitude and holiness and obedience and showing the thankfulness that is due his love. And so here we see, please, but also you're going to start to see now there's going to be this element of God when someone is beloved of God, this, this, this word chosen is incredibly important. Very important. Okay. I could take you to Mark chapter 12, verse six, where Jesus tells a parable about the beloved son. I encourage you to go read it. I just don't feel led to read that. Um, instead, I want to take you to John three. So, so that's Jesus being the beloved. And I know you're going, I, I don't know how this is about identity at all. Your identity is completely built on Jesus. It depends on him. It hangs on him. It's possible because of him. His identity as the perfect human that we can ever be, that identity is extended to us through faith. So this is very important to understand. And I know I've touched on dimensions of this in the past. But, okay, this specific dimension of God loving you being beloved, I have not touched on. So it's very important that I teach this well. Yeah. Your life could change. Com you can have a complete 180 change in your life just by understanding this. So when we get to John 3, we're going to see that the Father loves the Son. What does that look like? Specifically here, it's that the Father has given all things into his hand. So for Jesus to be the beloved is not just to have this identity and position, but it's going to be, the Father's going to express his love and validate that position by doing certain things to the Son. One of those things is that he gives all things into his hand. This is authority, this is dominion, this is power to give eternal life as the perfect resurrected human who's undergone our death and paid for our sin. This is the Father handing over all things to the Son. That's an expression of God's love, or you might say, it's proof that Jesus is the beloved. John 5, 20, for the Father loves the Son and he shows him all that he himself is doing. Greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. So in John 5, 20, what does it mean that the Father loves the Son? It's that the Father shows the Son everything he's doing. Now that is not something that's true of anyone else throughout biblical history. Anyone else in the scriptures, any prophet, anyone who walked with God, anyone who had faith, they did not know all that the Father was doing. So... Um, one of the ways God expresses love or validates the Son as the Beloved is in disclosing everything that the Son could possibly know about the Father's plan and will. Now, you could go to the point where Jesus doesn't know the time of His coming and, and all that. The point here is all that the Father is doing in a, in a complete and total sense 
even in Jesus's lifetime on the earth, like who to heal, who to go to, who to have a conversation with, what city to go to, all these things, the father inviting the son to know all that the father is doing in the world, in eternity, that's an expression of God's love. That's a validation of the son being the beloved. Okay, so I just want you to see that in this context, disclosure, invitation, sharing, like think of like Abraham. Um, God's about to decimate Sodom and Gomorrah. He's standing with Abraham, however that works, and he's having a conversation with himself, which is odd. God's just having a good old convo with him, himself. Abraham overhears it, and God like intentionally speaks, like he's doing it on purpose. He's talking loud enough for Abraham to hear. He's not trying to be quiet. Unlike my son who tries to tell secrets across the table, hey, dad, mom doesn't hear us. Mom is not deaf. In fact, Abraham actually overhears, which is what God wanted, and then God is inviting Abraham to come and intercede um, for Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah because Abram knows that's where my that's my where my nephew is, and so what happens is God the conversation he has with himself um, it ends up going like this pretty much I'm about to go check out what I've heard in Sodom and Gomorrah and bring destruction on them should I let Abraham know he's having this loud conversation with himself so Abraham's obviously like. Well, I know now. And so through that conversation, the reason God says, should I not let Abram know is because he is because of the fact that he's appointed Abram to be the father of many nations. So the logic God has in that passage is I've appointed Abraham to be the father of many nations. Shouldn't I include him or let him know what I'm doing in Sodom and Gomorrah, especially because Lot is there? You know, and then this whole thing transpires where Abraham goes, whoa, hey, whoa, aren't you righteous? And then that whole thing happens. But that's that's another example of, of God disclosing because he's uniquely chosen someone. Uh, it, it's an expression of his love. It's, a, it's an expression of the fact that God has indeed chosen that individual uh, uniquely from the rest of humanity. You know, and Jesus here is also. Now, in John chapter 10, verse 17, I want to show you something. This has always somewhat frustrated my theology, but I think I've made sense of it now. In John 10, 17, it says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I laid down my life, that I may take it up again. In other words, it's as if Jesus is saying, at, at face value, it seems like he's saying, God loves me because I'm going to sacrifice myself. But if I didn't, then he wouldn't love me. Is that what he's saying? There's one possible way to explain this. It's that the father loving the son here is not the result of Jesus offering up himself, but the love of the father for the son is proven by the son rising from the dead after laying down his life. That's one way to read this. In other words, this doesn't become a, here's why the Father loves. Rather, it reads like this, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life and I I may take it up again. It might read like, here's how you're going to know that the Father loves me, because I'm going to lay down my life, and then it's going to be taken up again. That will prove to the world. And we have scripture to back that up. I think Romans chapter 1 speaks on that. And and there are other statements in scripture that talk about the fact that uh, the ultimate way God has validated his son is through the resurrection. Uh, when Jesus is hanging on the cross and the religious leaders mocking him are going, if he's actually the beloved of God, then God would spare him and bring him down. They see it as like, if God truly loves this man, if or if this man is truly who he claims to be as the beloved chosen Messiah, then God wouldn't let him go through what he's going through. So they have a category in their mind that says, God loving means God sparing from any kind of pain and suffering. But actually, Jesus is saying, I'm going to lay down my life. It's going to be taken up again. And that's how you're going to know. This is going to be a reason that you know the Father loves me. Um, 
But in this context, the reason I bring it up is because of the fact that this goes right in line with the statements we've already seen, that God loves the Son. Uh, he's the beloved of the Father. And the resurrection is going to be a part of proving that. But also, um, Jesus here is obeying the Father even unto death, laying down his life for criminals, for a world full of criminals that are accusing him of crime. He's going to lay his life down for them. And that becomes not just an act of obedience, um, but the reason that God will express his love in the form of the resurrection. You know, you don't have a resurrection without a death. You don't have death without someone, or at least Jesus' death, without him willingly laying down his life. Because he says, no one takes it from me. I, I lay it down myself. And this is the charge I've received from my father, right? So, you know, that's one way to make sense of that verse. That's, that's how I've come to understand it. Not a reason... Not like God's like, I won't love you until you actually do what I told you to do. Because there's so many scriptures that fly in the face of that. Jesus is validated and the beloved of the Father before he ever actually does that. So it can't be that he gets the Father's love once he dies for humanity. There must be something else going on. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So this is where we get to us. I know it's been a painful journey so far. I'm going really slow because I'm tired. But we're finally at the point where we can talk about now we are beloved in Christ. But that sets the tone. Jesus is the focus. He's the center. He's the, he's the foundation of it all. So if I tell you, hey guys, you're beloved, and then you leave without understanding of how you're beloved or why you're beloved or what it means to be beloved, it does you no good. I can give you all the scriptures in the world and go, look, you're beloved. If you don't know what that means or how that's possible or why it's possible or why it's true, then it can't really be something you enjoy if you can't understand. Hey, you're beloved. Well, what does that mean? You're beloved. You're loved by God. Oh, okay. But I want to give you deeper understanding. It all relates to Jesus first being the ultimate beloved for us. But now Colossians 1.13, it says... He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So you and I go, so how, where's the bridge? How does Jesus' death and resurrection connect me to my new life as a child of God? How does that bridge the gap between me and God? How do I go from an enemy of God, hostile, I hate God, I'm dead in sin, to all of a sudden I'm beloved? How, how does the cross fit into that equation? Colossians 1.13 is your answer. We have forgiveness, we have redemption in the Son, who Paul wants you to know is the beloved of the Father, and he's doing that on purpose. Because we've been transferred from the domain of darkness, that territory, that kingdom of evil, into the kingdom of the beloved son. Why does Paul add that extra description in? He could have said into the kingdom of, of light, into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of Jesus. But he specifically refers to Jesus as the beloved son. Because Jesus being the beloved is what's going to make way for us to be a part of his kingdom, have forgiveness and redemption. Which is why Ephesians 1 verse 6. So that's practically how the, how the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus fits into how we can go from what we were to who we are now. Why am I now beloved? Because Jesus, the beloved, has grafted you into his kingdom. He's given you forgiveness and redemption. He's pulled you out of that domain where you were a hostile enemy of God. So that now Ephesians 1 6 is true. He has blessed us in the beloved. Just the end of verse 6 is what I want to focus on. He has blessed us in the beloved. So you go, how am I blessed? How am I loved of God now as a child? How am I beloved? Because you're in his son who is the beloved. And so that identity is extended to you. Jude chapter 1, the only chapter in Jude. So really it's just Jude 1. 
This is how he introduces his, his letter. He says, A servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Now you might use this as an eternal security argument. I sure have. Not on its own, but alongside everything else. But it's interesting to note that the way Jude refers to his audience is those who are called are those who are beloved in the Father. It's positional language. You are in, and Jesus touches on this. He goes, you are in me, which means you're in the Father now, because I'm in the Father. And so he'll say, you're in my hand, and I'm, I'm in the Father's hand. It's this double form of security and confidence and, you know, guarantee. But to be beloved here for us, it relates to being in Firstly, Jesus, which is why we're in God. So I, I want you to understand that everything I showed you about Jesus being the beloved, uh, the Father having a deep pleasure for the, in the Son and being pleased with the Son, um, the Father you know, loving the Son uniquely, choosing the Son, um, you're about to see those things kind of for believers now. We are beloved. Now, I'm not saying we've replaced Jesus as the beloved. I'm saying... If Jesus is uh, a container, I don't want to, you know, just minimize Jesus to just a, an object, but if I'm going to use a, a visual demonstration, if this mug with my wonderful green tea represents Jesus as the beloved, and I've used, you know, a picture like this before, but for those that have never seen this, and if we're positioned in him through faith, or grafted in him, whether you use the branch analogy, whether you use the Moses being tucked in the cleft of the rock Im imagery, we're put in Christ spiritually so that Ephesians says we're seated in heavenly places with him. Where he is, we are because we're in him, right? So as the beloved of the Father, we're placed in him so that now when the Father looks at us, he sees us through the identity of his perfect son who happens to be, again, the Beloved. Which is why now we are referred to and treated as the Beloved because we take on that beautiful uh, characteristic of Jesus as the perfect resurrected human. He shares that. He goes, he goes, it's as if Jesus, and he says this in John 14 through 16 and, and in 1 John chapter 1, there's an invitation from, from Jesus to come and enjoy the love of God. And it starts by, and it requires, believing in the Son. There's an invitation. A lot of people frame it up as, hey, you can get out of hell. But the gospel is actually presented as, hey, come and share, participate in the love of God, this eternal communion and love that the Father and the Son have I've always shared by the Spirit. Come and share in that. We want to graft you. We want you to get caught up in this beautiful whirlpool of love. Just get sucked into it. Come and enjoy it. Come and fellowship. Come and lavish in it. Come and delight in this love that God has for you that he, he has always had with the Son, but now he said, hey, you, come and be a part of this. I know you're like a foreigner and you're weird, but if you believe in my Son, you, have, you can have a right to, to enjoy the love we've had for all eternity. That's the invitation, is to come and be loved by God. A lot of people don't think about it like that. And it's, it's sad because then you emphasize the wrath and the condemnation you deserve and the separation and the suffering and, and the love gets lost in translation. And you have to balance love and justice and grace. So again, to be loved of God differently than the world is loved by God. We're going to draw this distinction in the last episode. But there is a difference between the way God loves us and the way he loves the world. The reason we're now treated differently and loved uniquely as God's chosen is because we're in his son who is the beloved. And he treats us according to his son, not according to our sin. The third thing I want you to see, if I haven't made this clear, first, Jesus is beloved. Secondly, we are beloved in Christ, but also we are actually chosen to be the beloved of the Father. Now remember, beloved is like this um, unique, deep, personal, intimate love 
not in a romantic way, but in a, in a, in a relational sense where God deeply esteems and values and, and treats you as a dear one of his. You're precious. That's, 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 a, that's actually the language used of Jesus. He's a precious cornerstone. And now we get to be his precious children. You're precious to the Father. That's just part of what it means to be loved. But it also involves this dimension of being chosen for that love. What I mean by that is we saw in, um, what was it, Mark, Matthew chapter 12, where Jesus is chosen. He's the servant the Father has chosen, and he's the beloved of the Father, whom the Father is pleased with. So what we have here is a, is a relationship between being chosen and being beloved. It's as if you can't have one without the other because God chooses someone to be an object of his precious love. That's what you're chosen for when you're, you put your faith and trust in Christ. You're chosen for a lot of other things. But I believe, scripturally, you're, you're mainly chosen to be an object of God's divine love and to be treated as his precious child. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 it says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you. So I'm not the one who's making these connections un- unfounded. These are like legitimate uh, connections in Scripture. Uh, not just with Jesus, but here in Colossians and Romans, um, several times, Paul specifically is going to connect being beloved with being chosen. I want you to pause and think about that. Have a Selah moment. Just meditate on that. What it means to be beloved involves being chosen, handpicked, uniquely picked out by God. Because we've placed our faith in Jesus, He has chosen that group of people for a lot of different things, mainly to be loved. So to be beloved here, beloved brothers, Paul refers to them, it means God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So what does God choose his beloved children for? In this context, and this also answers the question, what does it mean to be loved by God? Well, he's chosen you to be saved. He's chosen you to be sanctified by His Spirit because you believed in the truth. So, and specifically the Thessalonians here are the first fruits um, or those from the beginning, you know, the early stages of the church um, among some of the first in, in history, you might say, to be New Covenant believers in the Messiah. Real quick, if you don't know me, my name is Jason, and I have some free gifts for you at AboveReproachMinistry.com. Go to the website or click the links in the description below to check out all of our free Bible study resources. We have online Bible classes, devotional studies, Bible study workshops, all of my sermon notes, and more. You can even join our online church community on the Discord app. We also have discussion groups all around the world, and if you don't see one in your area, message me and we'll help you start a launch group. I personally lead a group in Spartanburg, South Carolina. If you live in the area, we'd love to have you join us on Fridays for Bible study. So contact me if you're interested, and if you or your church would like me to come preach or teach, just message me or shoot me an email, and we'll see what we can do, because I love preaching in person. If you're a new follower of Jesus, click the New Believers section to access everything we recommend for new believers. And be sure to snag a copy of my book, Fruitful, to support this ministry. All right, that's all I got for you. Let's jump back into the video. So we are beloved of God. That's what it means to be chosen. But also is that God has loved you in the sense that he's chosen you to be saved. The rest of the world is not. He's chosen you to be sanctified. The world in darkness is not. And it's because you've chosen to believe in the truth. He's not chosen you to believe the truth. He's chosen you because you believed in the truth. Does that make sense? That's the difference between the way I understand predestination and, you know, uh, being chosen by God versus the way mainstream Calvinism does. This is not a fly-by, you know, uh, attack on Calvinism. I'm just distinguishing. I don't believe 
in Calvinistic theology, at least as it's mostly understood in, in mainstream Calvinism. I was Calvinist for a while. I can't, I just, I can't see scripture differently. Colossians 3.12, it says, put on then as God's chosen ones. Now watch, holy and beloved. So to be a chosen one of God means to be holy and beloved. And he says, because you're God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, which Ephesians confirms this, you're chosen to be holy. And you're chosen to be loved, uniquely loved by God as his precious child. You're chosen to be esteemed above the rest of the world that's in darkness. You're chosen to be favored in Christ above the rest of the world that's in darkness. You're a dear one. You, have, you get a personal experience of God's love flowing through in your life. Whereas the world doesn't necessarily have that relationship, do they? they there, there are ways in which God loves the world, but we'll get to this in, in the final episode where we talk about the difference between the way God loves his children versus the world. But it's appropriate for those who are God's chosen ones, since you're holy and beloved, not to be holy and not to be loved, but because you are, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. Why? Because that's appropriate for, for someone who's been handpicked, chosen by God to belong to him as his precious child, to experience his love in a deeply intimate and divine way where you're treated as precious and that to be loved by God almost demands, and I, I hesitate to say demand because I don't want you to think like God's holding a, like a gun to your head going, love me because my my love for you demands it. It's This is like what his love is worthy of. I think that's a better way to say it. His love for us is so deserving of and worthy of our compassionate hearts. Kindness, humility. So in that sense, you might say his love is so precious that itself demands such a response from us of gratefulness and, 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 and you know holiness and, and love and obedience. But, you know, I know some people would get frustrated by me saying it like that. So I said it anyway. Romans 9.25, it says, in Hosea, he says, Paul's quoting Romans, or uh, in Romans, he's quoting Hosea. And this is very encouraging. It just notes the way God brings an enemy into his family. It says, those who are not my people, I will call my people. Her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Now, Romans 9 in context, I believe, is mostly talking about the Gentiles. Because verse 24, um, in this context, he talks about how, you know, God has called not just the Jews, but the Gentiles. And the way he proves that is with Hosea. At one point, the Gentile nations were not the people of God. Why? Because God chose Israel as a nation to be his beloved. That's why there's the, the marriage analogy to demonstrate the relationship between God and, and the nation. That the, the bride analogy where Israel is a woman, Jerusalem's a woman, a bride, um, you know, a virgin at first. All these different ways of explaining the way God treated Israel uniquely from the rest of the nations. But now... Through Christ, by his life, death, and resurrection, those who used to not be the people of God, they used to not be beloved, they weren't a part of the nation of Israel. Could they have a way to be grafted into Israel? Absolutely. But the pagan nations on their own entirely were not God's chosen people. But now, in Christ, you can be beloved. Regardless of your ethnicity, where you descend from, where you're at geographically, you can be called God's people, where he, uh, I don't want to say like possesses you, because again, that language frustrates people, but where he um, deeply values you as his own. He uh, treats you as precious is the best thing I can think of. Again, back to the uh, 
the illustration I used in the last message where like my kids treat their some of their toys for like a day or two as precious. You know, God treats us as precious forever. So this is the way in which God allows those who were not his people, not beloved, to become beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you're not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. In other words, Gentiles now can have the full-blown spiritual identity of spiritual Israel because you're grafted into Jesus, who is the ultimate Israelite, Jew, human that none of us ever could be. And so to be children of God is to be beloved, to be the people of God. And at one point, this was not a possibility. Not in, the, not in the way it is now in Christ. He made it possible. So you and I are loved. I want you to get this in your head as we move forward in the series. In every season, in every moment, for the rest of your eternity, if you are in Christ, there is a, there is a constant reality that's true for you. It's ultimate reality. It's that you are loved by God. And what pastors and preachers and abusers of the word do with that is they go, you're loved by God all the time, so live however you want. That's not true. That's a terrible conclusion to come to. That tells me you have a very wrong idea of the grace and the love of God. You have lots of misconceptions you've believed. So I encourage you, hey, we are loved by God at every moment, fully and perfectly, because we're positioned in His Son. And you go, I don't understand the conclusion. How do you come to that conclusion? Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The love the Father has for the Son is perfect. It's eternal. It's to the fullest extent. It doesn't go up and down. It's not based on anything except the fact that Jesus is who he is. And now because you are in his Son who never changes, and the love the Father has for the Son never changes, it doesn't go up and down. You, being in the Son, are treated in that same way. Because God has graciously allowed your faith to graft you into him. So that now you're in Christ and the love the Father has for the Son, guess what? Is always fully, perfectly flowing into your life and reality. It's, it's your constant reality. So even if your finances go up and down, even if your health goes up and down, even if you lose a family member, even if your house goes into foreclosure, even if, I'm, I'm listing out these extremes Because I want you to see the ultimate, the greatest, most important thing in our lives, our ultimate priority, is that God loves us. We are his people. We are beloved of the Father. We are children of God. That does not change. Now, you have the choice and the responsibility to as much as you can with your mind, or technically mind, biblically, Focus on that above all else. All day, every day, my constant reality is that I am beloved of God. Even when life is a living hell, even when life is great, even when the kids are doing fantastic, even when uh, I'm, I'm at ease and I don't have to worry about Karen knocking on my door because I got to move, even when my car has gas in it and I have a job that's like paying way more than we need and I can give, in the midst of all of that, the ebbs and flows of life and the changing of circumstances and you aging and getting fat where you didn't want to, he loves me. He loves me. And what you're going to see is that this is, this truth will change everything for you. I know you've been told God loves you. I I know you have. In fact, we live in a world where like an atheist, you go up to them and go, God loves you. Even though they don't believe in God, they somehow feel entitled to his love. How do you feel entitled to a love that you don't even know, you don't even believe exists? (laughs) And the world at large kind of looks at the sacrificial work of Jesus and goes, well, yeah, he should love me. I mean, look at me. And they have such a prideful, inflated view of themselves. They think they're deserving of the love of God. They think they're entitled to Jesus. Yeah, God should die for me. Are you serious? Are you out of your ever-loving mind? You think God should lay his life down for you? You're entitled to that? You deserve that? This 
truth that God graciously chooses to love me eternally, perfectly, fully, all the time, in every season, for all the rest of my existence. That truth and reality is something that should not be possible. (laughs) And yet it is. That truth is something that should be the constant focus of our lives. And you go, that's a bit extreme. I need to worry about my relationship with my wife and my kids and my finances and getting a job and not getting kicked out of school because I've been late seven times and I don't want my mom to beat me. John the Apostle Sorry, I don't, I don't want my mom to, to spank me. Beat is a little harsh. <clears throat> For those of you that are still under your parents' house. John the Apostle has... You see this in his writings. He's been so profoundly changed to the core by the love of Jesus. Um, to, to the point where he spends... Whenever he addresses himself in the Gospel of John, he refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Right here. What would it do if we began to see ourselves like this? In in every moment, in every circumstance, in rejection, in acceptance, in in abundance, in lack, in in sickness, in health, in poverty, in, in, in everything in a car accident, in me, like not knowing where I'm going to be tomorrow, not knowing if they're actually going to go through with the divorce. What if we learned at every turn of life to see ourselves like this, the one whom Jesus loved? I mean, you can read John 13, 23, go to John 19, 26, the disciple whom he loved, You can go to John 20, verse 2. The one whom Jesus loved. I mean, John has come to a place in his life, at least when he's writing this and recalling these events and recording them, that he identifies more with the love of Jesus than anything else. And you see it in 1 John. First John is, is this invitation that's like, guys, I've been so eternally impacted, changed to the core by the love of God, that I just want to invite you into this. That, that's how John essentially starts First John. That's what First John chapter 1 is dedicated to. It's I want you to come in fellowship and know this love. Before meeting Jesus, um, you could see it in the way John interacts with the rest of the disciples and they all interact with each other, that this love has not yet penetrated the core of their being. But over time, as John has walked with Jesus and seen Jesus and heard him and experienced his love, the way he identifies himself is, hey guys, it's as if like if John had a name tag, and he worked at Best Buy, (laughs) his name tag wouldn't be John. It wouldn't say John the Apostle, the one who almost called down fire, the son of thunder, the one who took care of Jesus' mom. Anyone else do that? No, I didn't think so, Peter. His name tag says would say the one whom Jesus loved. That's what it would say. If you were to, if you were to like record anything written by him, (laughs) And then he were to sign it. it. Probably wouldn't say John the Apostle. It would be the, and he does this in his gospel. It'd be, hey, I'm, I'm someone that Jesus loves. He, he identifies with God's love so deeply that he sees himself as an object of God's precious love. Not to objectify John and make him just some, some thing. But you know what I mean. Like he becomes the direct object of God's love. And he's been changed from the inside out. That's what I want for you guys. Is to get to a point in your life and in your faith 
where you don't identify with anything else. You don't let anything else determine your value or your identity. You don't let anything else tell you who you are or how valuable you are. There's one constant unchanging thing that determines who you are and how valuable you are. And it's the fact that God has chosen to love you. You are beloved. That, that's the most important thing you can take away. Is that you are beloved of God. You are beloved. So, the conclusion or the, you know, the, the way we respond to this is, okay, since you are beloved, go and be loved. And you gotta know what that means. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 is a good starting place. So I showed you that John has, you know, I don't know what he used to identify with before Jesus. I don't know what he used to let determine his value and identity. I don't know. But I do know that at the time of writing the gospel in 1 John, he has changed. He no longer identifies with anything of this world. In fact, he'll tell everyone, hey, I'm telling you, don't love the world. You should hate, hate this world system. Be against it. Be opposed to the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Those things that probably John used to love without Christ, you know, sin. And then suddenly he's changed forever. Or think of John chapter 8. The woman who was caught in adultery. How are you even caught in adultery? The other guy wasn't even. You know, all these questions we have. And she is called by Jesus, go and sin no more. Why? Because the grace and the love of God has so radically invaded her life that you would expect a change. So for us to go, I am beloved, that never changes. That doesn't go up and down. That's not based on circumstances or my obedience or my own personal holiness and good moral efforts. It's not based on a condition of life and how well my circumstances are going. It's based on his son, which means it never changes. It's full. It's perfect. It's eternal. It's forever. Since that's true, and I am beloved of the Father in Christ now, and we are the beloved children of God, how should you respond to that? Well, what I found fascinating, and I really meant that word, that's the appropriate word, what I found fascinating as I studied any time, you know, the saints are referenced as beloved or you know, the word beloved is used to describe the people of God, is that almost every time I came across it, there is a call to action. In other words, there's an urging, there's a pleading to do something, there's a motivation to get to work and act on it. Almost as if like, um, if my son, and sometimes he does crap like this, if my son's six, and so, you know, sometimes he's just being goofy with his sister, find a pull-up, put a diaper on, whatever it is, and I can tell him, son, take that off, and he should listen, right? But it's another thing for me to urge him and, and encourage him to do that and tell him to do that by reminding him of who he is. Son, you're not a baby, that is not appropriate for who you are and how old you are. Like, I understand Layla, she's still three and she's still having fun pooping on the walls. But you, you're six. So let's take that off. That's not appropriate. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to urge you to, to take that off by reminding you of how old you are. That's what happens almost every time I saw the word beloved. And I found it fascinating because it's as if People like Paul, people like James, people like John, as they're writing to believers, they're not just saying, hey, stop it, you dummy. <laughs> Come on. Give up sexual impurity. Stop being deceived. Don't imitate evil. They reinforce that with, hey, beloved, don't do this. Or beloved, I urge you to do this. It's as if the biblical authors are reminding Christians of who they are as motivation to do what they're asking them to do. So they'll go, you know, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Now, he didn't have to add that part. He could have just said, be imitators of God. That makes sense. That's a command. That's appropriate. 
but he tags on this as beloved children, right? Because you're beloved children of God, this is appropriate. This makes sense. Follow your father. Imitate him. And the best way you can imitate the love of God is by imitating the son and walk in love like he did. And he gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We talked about this when we addressed being priests of God. So be imitators as beloved children. He could have stopped and said, just imitate God. But he says, look, you guys are beloved children of God. Think about that. Because that's true, what is appropriate, what is reasonable, what makes the most sense is that you would imitate your father because you are children of God. John will do a similar thing in 1 John 4 where he says, beloved. It's as if that word really gets the attention of the listener or the audience. Like if I just said the most shocking word, I can get I can get your attention easily by using some shocking words. But John's shock effect is to use the word beloved. It's as if Christians' ears perk up. He's talking to us. Like this this notes seriousness. There's an urgency behind this. That means what he's almost like when Jesus says, Verily, verily I say to you, or truly, truly I say to you, it's like, we should really listen. Drop the fish, Peter. Shut up and listen. He's about to say something really important. That's what it's like. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Meaning, because you are beloved of the Father and He's treated you with such tremendous love, it makes sense that you should go and love others. He reinforces the command with who they are. Does it make sense? So he doesn't tell them to do something without any motivation or reinforcement or reasoning. He says, because you're beloved, because that's who you are, go and love one another. And you go, I don't. Why is that something that should, should be something I do? Because now loving people is not from a place of trying to gain God's love. It's from a place of enjoying and having received and experienced the love of God yourself. We all know Christians who can Bible thump the crap out of people. And they do. And you wonder, like, have you ever encountered the love of God, like, truly? Because I see a lot of anger and bitterness and you taking out almost your rage on the people who have done nothing to you. And there's zero compassion or understanding or mercy. It's, it's pure and utter wrath. Even when prophets like Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Isaiah would urge the people to change and say condemnation and judgment is coming and wrath is coming, the day of the Lord is coming, there was always this loving urge to change that was motivated by the compassion of God. And then we've all met believers where it's like, did you, did you come from heaven? You are so loving. It is incredible. I've never met anyone so loving. And usually they're around the age of 89 to 98. <laughs> you are so sweet. Can I adopt you? Little Nancy, I just want you to be my grandma. You are so sweet. You're so loving. You obviously know the love of God. That kind of love is appropriate to those who have been called beloved. So, you know, John will go on and make the argument that if you don't love, you don't know him. And that makes sense. Because if you knew him, you'd be changed into his likeness by the born-again experience. You'd have a new heart, a new set of desires. You'd have a new nature that's compatible with love. And then you'd go and love like your father. But the fact that you're not proves that maybe you have not yet changed and become the beloved of God. Beloved, let us love one another. There it is again, beloved. For love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So there you go. I didn't, I didn't say this. John did. Love is the proof you are at the core a beloved child of God. 
that it's one of the greatest evidences that you truly belong to him is that you have been loved and that love has changed you, right? Third John, some of you didn't know there was a third John. You're like, Jesus, is there a seventh John? Third John chapter one, the only chapter there, verse 11, it says, Beloved, don't imitate evil. Imitate what is good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen him. Very similar statement to 1 John 4, isn't it? But instead, the doing good or imitating good refers to the loving people and loving God the way God loves. But notice how he urges them by reminding them who they are. You are beloved. Because you've been loved by God and you can enjoy the love of God on a daily, on a daily basis, don't imitate evil. That's, that's incompatible. That's unreasonable. That goes against who you are as one who is loved by God. I could take you to James chapter 1, 16 through 17. I'm just showing you that almost when the biblical authors will use the word beloved is to get the attention, to really get the attention of the audience. And then he's going to urge them to do something. Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above comes from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. You are beloved of God. Know who He is. Know what He gives. Know how to recognize what a gift from God is versus an opportunity from the enemy and the devil that's masked as a good gift. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, okay, we continue... Because, you know, I showed you that we are beloved of God. Why and how? And now the question becomes, well, how, how do I just be loved by God? Because some of you have a hard time doing that, as do I. You really find it hard to receive love and enjoy His love. Because you're afraid you'll mess it up. You're afraid you'll lose it, just like you've lost relationships in the past. You've been so scarred by childhood trauma that you think, if I don't perform well enough, I might, I might lose out on this opportunity to enjoy the love of God into eternity, and I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up. Some of you just don't know how to receive and enjoy the love of God. And part of the way we receive is by believing, absolutely, trusting that is true. But it also does include action. Jesus will, Jesus will say in John 15, and we'll get to this, we'll get to this, that the way you abide in his love is by doing what he commands. Okay? So there is a profound connection between obedience and in experiencing and enjoying the love of God. It's almost like one of the best ways to enjoy the love of God is by doing what he says, trusting he'll take care of you, and trusting that his love for you is enough for you to move forward and do what he says. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Notice again, run from idolatry, but it's almost like a reminder. As you pursue and try and do this, Remember who you are. Because here's what I'm convinced of. Here, here's the conclusion I've come to as I look at all these different commands and urges that are connected to being beloved children of God. I am convinced that long-term obedience is sustained by an accurate view of who I am. So if I know who I am, the better I know who I am, the more sustainable my obedience is long term. Because now you're not obeying God from an orphan mindset or from this works-based mentality performance mindset. You're obeying and loving God from a place of being secure in His love for you. Because you know who He is and you know who He says you are and that is what reinforces long-term obedience. It's so much easier to do what God says when you know who he is and you know who you are as you're doing it. Because there are a lot of you who do what God says because you're trying to be something in his sight. 
as if you can change in the sight of God. And you're trying to earn what Jesus has already given you as a free gift. You're trying to maintain what Jesus secures by his grace and his work. You're trying to become something that God has already made you to be, not by your efforts, but by his grace. And so when he says, flee from idolatry, notice how he doesn't say, flee from idolatry so you can be loved by God. He says, because you're beloved, let me remind you who you are, it's appropriate, and it makes sense, to flee from idolatry. Why? And I got to thinking, I'm even thinking the, about this real time, why are so many of the commands and urges in the New Testament reinforced by beloved, beloved, let me ri- remind you that you're loved by God, deeply valued and chosen and, and favored by Him. Why is that the reinforcement of the commands? And I'd love to know your guys' thoughts in the chat. But I'm convinced, again, that when you value the love of God most, you find yourself valuing and giving in to sin less, right? So if I'm secure in the love of God because I know I'm loved and I can enjoy and experience that, I will lose my, uh, my palate for sin. I will lose this appetite, not entirely, the sinful flesh is always there waging war against the spirit, but I'll find myself giving in to sin less because I'm so satisfied by the love of God for me. And this is what the psalmist says, your love is better than life. You go, what? How could anyone ever say such a statement? Someone must have held a gun to his head. No, he has walked with God long enough to realize that everything else in this world that you could ever want or imagine, it pales in comparison. It doesn't come close, anywhere near, to being loved by God. That is the most satisfying, fulfilling, you're made I, I said this, you know, the last episode, you're made to worship. But equally true is this, you're made to be loved by God. He made humanity as an object of his loving grace. So, that's what I'm trying to get you to understand is, this is not a call to do anything to become loved or to earn his love. It's because you're loved Why would you give yourself over to something that disrupts your experience of his love? First Corinthians 15, it says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in your in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Sometimes it's hard to remember that. We forget that so easily. We just get discouraged and overwhelmed by life, anxious, and it's too much, man. It's too much. I can't, I can't handle it. It's like, Lord, take me home now. And what Paul wants you to know is all your efforts toward the glory of God, they're not in vain. And at the same time, you're beloved. And that's the greatest encouragement. It's, I, I'll tell you, There's a mindset shift that takes place for believers, and it has taken place in me at times, but I I sometimes default to my old way of thinking. But the mindset shift is this. As I'm obeying God, I'm no more loved by Him than when I don't. That encourages me to obey rather than to disobey. If you hear me say you are loved by God every second, every moment as a child of God. If you hear me say that and you think, good, I can get away with sin now. There are a number of scriptures that would speak to the fact that you're either immature and you're a new believer or you're not a believer at all. It's a harsh statement, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 7, 1, since we have these promises, beloved, not to gain these promises, not to secure them, since you have them, (laughs) beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. Let's bring holiness to completion in the fear of God. So we don't fear God from a place of like, I don't know if he loves me. He might just, 
He might whoop me. Oh, you know, discipline and training are a sign of God's love for sure. We'll get to that episode three. But you don't have to fear God in, a, in, in the form of terror and horror. And, and this like, I'm terrified he's going to strike me with lightning. And if I don't like the fear of the Lord, we've talked about this pretty much in every episode. So I don't need to bring it up again. But here, Paul encourages the church. Stay away from those things that defile your body and spirit. And they might go, why? So we can get to heaven? He's like, no, because you are children of, because you're loved by him. When you value the love of God, and that's everything to you, you start to see sin as a disruption of that flow. There's a sweet spot. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. There's a sweet spot in, in, in the Christian faith where at times you're, you're so aware of God's love for you. You're so satisfied. You're so fulfilled. It's enough. You're like, I could die right now in the most gruesome way, but I know the love of, like you, you think the most crazy things because you're like, nothing can take this away. This is Romans chapter eight. The love of God is everything, right? And there are these, these moments where it's like, I don't, wanna, I don't want this to be disrupted. Like, I don't, I don't want to lose focus and lose awareness of the, of the love of God in this moment that I have. I don't want to be pulled out of this moment and brought back into the concerns of the world and, and troubles and financial lack and anxiety and health problems. I don't want to be taken away from this place. We have those moments, right? Where it's like the love of God is everything. In those moments... Sin is nothing. <laughs> Sin ain't, ain't even enticing. Your flesh could be just wilding out, going crazy, just alert after alert. Hey, you should do this. You should think this. Hey, let's meditate on this. And you're like, I am so resistant to those sinful desires right now because I'm so satisfied by God's love. It's as if, and maybe I'm reading into these texts, but it's as if the love of God is so satisfying and to be loved by God is so what you're made for, right? That you begin to see sin as a disruption of that love. And you're like, I don't, I don't want anything to disrupt this beautiful, the flow of God's love in my life right now. And I'm not willing to give it up for sin. You start to see sin and frame it up like that. Where it's not just like, oh, I don't want to deal with the consequences. I don't want to have to repent again. It's that, I want I treat his name as holy and this beautiful place I'm in right now enjoying his love I don't want sin to pull me out of it and disrupt what God is doing with his love in my life Therefore my beloved Philippians 2:12 says as you've always obeyed so now not only is in my presence but much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling so is there a place for the fear of the Lord? Absolutely. That's the beginning of wisdom. That's what it means to love God. That's what it means to hate evils, to fear the Lord. And vice versa. But here, notice how Paul is saying, look, work out your own salvation. For it's God who works in you, right? Both to will and work for his good pleasure. But as you do that, notice how he reminds them that they are beloved. You and I are beloved of God. That's your identity. When you look in the mirror, you don't see a failure. You don't see an addict. You don't see someone who has so much childhood trauma you can't look anyone in the eyes anymore. You don't see that. What you see is someone who is deeply loved and treasured and valued by God. You see a child of God that is precious to the Father. You know, and I can go throughout, I can go to James 1.19, and I could just keep giving you encouragement after encouragement. 1 Peter 2.11, abstain for the passions of the flesh, beloved. 1 Peter 4.12, don't be surprised, beloved, when suffering comes. 2 Peter 3.14, beloved, be diligent to be holy and blameless and at peace in your lifestyle. 1 John 4.1, beloved, don't believe every spirit. Jude 1, beloved, keep yourselves in the love of God. There is a responsibility on us to do that. James 1.19, not in terms of like keeping his love 
to, you know, directed at us and keeping him loving us, but keeping myself in that beautiful river of the love of God and experiencing that and being aware of that and, and actually obeying his commands to find satisfaction in that love. And then James 1.19, there's all these different commands and these urges, be quick to hear, slow to anger. Look, the, the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. And then again, because you're beloved brothers, you're beloved of God. So to be loved by God, at the core, that's who you are, what that means is there is a, there's an expected way of life now. There's, an, there's a set of expectations for you as someone who is deeply loved and treasured by God. So there is both there is a deep value, but there's also a profound responsibility to have this kind of love in my life. There's a responsibility on me to walk in a way that's worthy, reasonable, um, showing gratitude, so to be loved by God, as we'll see this in episode two, it means I live as someone who is loved by God. Holiness, righteousness, obedience, love, purity, honesty, integrity, faithfulness, fear the Lord, all these different things. They are, it's, you would expect, I'm trying to think of the most, my mind always goes to like the most whack illustrations. But you don't expect a 40-year-old to be wearing a diaper unless there's something wrong, right? Back to the whole diaper thing. That's just a, that's not appropriate for someone who should be mature enough to hold in whatever it is that the diaper would otherwise contain. You, you don't expect, you go, that's, you know there's a problem because that's inappropriate for the age they're at to have something that is fitted for a baby. In the same way, when you look at someone who claims to be a child of God and, and I'm beloved of the Father and He loves me and I treasure His love and they, they treat everyone like horrendously. They're gossip and complaining and wicked and, and evil and just abusing people with their words and, and they have no regard for anyone else's cons, you know livelihood and benefit and they just trample on people. You go... You know what? I I don't expect that from someone who's been deeply loved and treasured by God. I don't that's not reasonable. That's not fitted. That's not fitting rather for someone who's been loved by God. So in the next episode we'll talk about how to live as those who are loved by God. What that looks like. And then again in episode 3 we'll talk about um the love of God in scripture, because I think it's on us to understand all the different facets and expressions of God's love throughout scripture and, and the picture that, you know, scripture is painting for us. Um, and then in, in the last episode we'll talk about, I think a lot of people are going to want to tune in for the last episode, which is the difference between God's love for us versus the difference um, or versus the way he loves the world. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to share your thoughts and your insights in the comments. If you want to share your thoughts and questions about these studies, join us every Thursday evening at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a live discussion together. And thank you for supporting this ministry. Your support helps us accomplish our mission, which is to teach people how to read the Bible so they can live and teach it for themselves. We're only able to make all of these free resources because of generous supporters like you. So thank you very much for all of your support. Make sure to visit AboveReproachMinistry.com to check out all of our free resources. And as always, keep moving towards Jesus.